Hi, everyone. Holly from Safe for Kids here today. And I'd really like to introduce you to um, a young man I reached out to after watching his stuff on Instagram. Harry, thank you for joining us today. I'm hoping that parents and teachers will really listen to our talk and, and think about how they can use the gold that's going to come out of your mouth because we've already had a chat and I already know it's going to be fantastic. Um, but would you like to start by introducing yourself and, and telling us a bit about your story? Of course. And first of all, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'd like to also just acknowledge that I am on Gadigal land today um, and I pay my respects to elders past and emerging, uh, past, present and emerging. Um, so to introduce myself, so I'm Harrison James. I came forward with my story via a video on Instagram that went, uh, I like that uh, people would say viral, but I, I'd like to be a bit more modest with it. Um, but I came forward with that video and ever since then it snowballed into me being a very public advocate uh, uh -huh. for male victims of sexual abuse and, and child victims of sexual abuse. And um, yeah, I champion them and I hope that my story uh, brings some wisdom and insights for people to go off and so we can avoid this happening to other children. Um, I want the next generation to reap the rewards of my trauma in a way. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. And um, I also run a clothing brand that raises funds for polished men to end violence against women and children. I run a condom brand that has consensual warnings on them, which is great as well. I've had parents buy them to have chats with their um, teenage children about consent and stuff which is great um, and I just I was a key collaborator with uh, what were you wearing a foundation based in Newcastle in New South Wales uh, to bring forth Australia's first uh, sexual assault awareness music festival uh, we just did that last weekend and we raised a, uh, just under eight grand uh, to to prevent sexual violence in the community so there's I do a plethora of different things and I'm very happy and proud of it yeah and so you should be um Thanks. you know being able to use these platforms to speak out to to help other young people realize that it's you know it's not an isolated incident mm -hmm. um you know i've had children after a lesson say so what miss it happens to other kids too sort of thing and they they do think that this is still after um you know we've had grace tame and and britney come yeah. out and, and still young people think you know i'm it's it's only happening to me. Mm, yeah, and it's uh, that's definitely the most insidious part of it, right? It's it's that that isolation, and no one deserves to feel like that. Full stop. But a vic a, a victim and a, and a survivor that's had to go through such horrendous things, they surely not that after the being through so much, they they don't deserve to be isolated or ever feel alone. You know, I have a friend. Um, whose name I won't mention because I don't <laughs> don't know if he wants me to say say it, but he always says to me, being a survivor, it's 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 the best club in the world with the worst membership, right? You don't want to be you don't want to be a survivor, but when you are, you're a part of this community that is full that is full with um, so many creative and and different individuals that that just have that inherent understanding. Um, and you just talk to them and they're beautiful, beautiful people. But you're right, there is that isolation before you come to that point. So I totally empathise with that and I, I, I want victim survivors to know that there is this community that you can reach out to and you will be accepted and, and loved in. So, yeah. And the other thing is, you know, when we talk about perpetrators, people instantly have a, a vision of what that looks like. Mm. Now, in in my training, I explain about 45% of all sexual abuse is either children to children or teenagers on children. That's not being talked about. Yeah. But also, nobody's talking about the, the style of abuse you actually um, experience because most people think it's a man in a Macintosh behind a, a bus stop that's yeah. going to leap out and grab children. Parents yeah. are still talking about stranger danger. So we know most sexual abuse is not by a stranger. Um, mm. But also, can you tell us about your actual story? Of course. Yeah, of course. Um, so I was taken advantage of for three years from the ages of 13 to 16 by my stepmother, uh, who was from the Philippines. So everyone has an idea of a pedophile, and it's usually never a five-foot Filipino woman, I can assure you of that. So it just goes to show that abuse can come from anywhere. 
and it can happen to anyone. And that's the greatest injustice of it, right? It, 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 it does not discriminate at all. And um, so I went through that for three years. It happened every day before and after school. Um, yeah, I remember I'd come home from school and I'd have to, you know, it, it would happen and I'd wake up in the morning. It would happen before I'd have to pack my lunchbox and stuff like that. So it was very, very uh, consistent for those three years. And actually when I was 15 years old, my stepmother, who was taking advantage of me, fell pregnant. And um, uh, to my daughter, who I had to pretend was my sister for many years later until I came forward because, um, you know, I wanted to protect who I, someone who I thought I was in love with. And, and obviously I wanted to protect my, my daughter that was coming into the world too, because I wanted to be the father to her that, um, I wanted to be a father for her. Yeah. The, not the father that I had. I wanted to be a good dad. Yeah. Sorry. I've stumbled on my words there, but yeah. So, um, that's what happened. And then um, when I was 19, I finally came forward to my close family, uh, my mother in particular, my real mother, um, after my stepmother fled the country. My father, I forgot to mention, my father was quite abusive throughout my childhood as well, physically um, and emotionally and stuff, never sexually. Um, but um, so my stepmother, who abused me, fled the country when I was 19 and falsely accused me of rape to get my father's uh, focus off her leaving and, and leave it on me. So it was just a throw under the bus. It was never, uh, yeah, it was just a blatant lie. But um, that's when I had to come forward to my mother because she knew something was up and I came forward then. And since then I went into a mental health rehab and came out of that um, in 2020 and I spent a year just working on myself. And then in 2022, I came forward with my story. And since then, I've been doing the advocacy. So that's a very brief rundown of my story. But yeah, it was very intense and very traumatic. And look, I've, it, although it seems like I've got it together now and I, I, I feel like I do, it comes in waves. It always comes in waves. And um, I'll always be struggling with it. Like I was diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder as a result of the uh, the trauma itself, it, it came directly from that. So that's a lifelong thing that I need to deal with as well. And I deal with it every day, but you know, I'm here standing, I'm strong and I've turned my trauma into something that, that actually helps other people. And, you know, it's taken me a long time to even admit that I do that, but it's true. I, I not to boast or say I'm a hero or anything, but it, it, what I do does help people. And I'm really proud of that because that's that was my intention from the outset. So, yeah. Why I'm so keen to talk to you is about, you know, the the misnomer that, you know, like I said, they're creepy men and, and stuff like that. Mm. Um, when we see stories like Grace Tames where it was a teacher, a male mm. teacher, um, you know, young fellas, you know, if, maybe if you had have told your mates what were go, was going on, they were, oh, you lucky dog, where yeah. to go? And, yeah, you know, I would they, have been praised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And so to talk to young men about this sort of stuff, and I know you talk out about mas um, toxic masculinity. I love your yeah. the stuff around that tape man that we won't mention. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I'm, <laughs> he's public <laughs> enemy number one in my eyes. So, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, Trying to work with young men, um, mm. I, I still think, you know, I love the the concert that you organised um, yeah. about, you know, you're not what you wear. Um, we've got to stop demonising young men. We need to help them. A lot of the young yeah. men I work with are lost. Um, yeah. You know, they admit to me. So when I'm working with a group of 14-year-olds, they admit to me of watching two hours a week of pornography. Mm. And when I say, fellas, why would you look at that? Oh, Holly, to learn technique, to learn style. Yeah, yeah. We are failing young people, but especially I think we're failing young men. And yeah. putting up good role models like yourself and, um, you know, we need solid young men like you to be standing up and saying, fellas, there is, you know, that's not what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, boys say to me, I'd much rather watch that, you know, porn than be with yeah. my girlfriend because she just lies there and that's so exciting. Yeah. But, you know, understanding that, you know, 
a screen's never going to love you back. And, and yeah. so do you actually go into schools and, and do education? I haven't had that opportunity yet, but it's something that I definitely want to get into. Um, just I feel as though I want to build my profile a little bit more. Um, but that's definitely, that's the end goal for me or one of the end goals um, to to really be on the ground and, and work firsthand with, with young men in particular. Um, but I, like you said, with the with the media thing, and thank you for your kind words to me when you said that we need role models like me, I really appreciate that. But um, when you look at the media, who are the role models? It is the Tates that get spoken about and the and the Trumps and the Kanye Wests and stuff like that. It's a very negative thing. So no wonder the world thinks that masculinity is very to toxic and 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 ill. And um, we do we do need to platform, you know, a a positive sort of masculinity. It's not what I'm looking for, but yeah, that's what we need to put on the on the on the TV screens and stuff like that. And I just hope that I am today. For the I am for the little boy today. What I needed at the time because I didn't have that right. So that's what it, that that was my intention with all this. That it was just to show kids that there's that there's an alternative. And you're right, kid. Young boys are lost. They're just trying to figure it all out, like all all young kids are. And um, for them to have poor examples just will lead a lot of them to the wrong direction. So. And I also think the exposure to the internet is something that we really need to work on too, for them to even have access to those sites and and for them to have access to people like the people I mentioned before. Um, it's 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 an issue that we need to work on. In an ideal world, we could we should license the internet, but it's just too big to do that now. But <laughs> but yeah. Um, something needs to be done about internet safety for children as well. I think they're far too exposed to even what I was exposed to as a kid. I mean, I grew up in, I was born in 2000, so I grew up when the internet was sort of just um, after the internet was really coming into things. But now it's just there. It's part of their identity. It's part of their DNA. And, um, yeah, it's something that we really need to look into. I don't know the answer to it, but I'm sure, I'm sure if I thought on it, I could come up with something. <laughs> Um, there's a, I'm going to miss it up, mess it up, but there's a saying something about you teach best the lesson that you need to, to learn. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, from watching your stuff, um, kids will really resonate with you and, um, be able to identify, you know, parts of their themselves, um, because, you know, young men, one of the things we talk about with kids is talking about your feelings and, mm. you know, from a very young age, we suppress young men's, Oh, you know, don't be cry. Don't be a girl and all of this sort of yeah. stuff. And why, yeah. why do we do that? Yeah. Um, you know, I say there's nothing more sexy than a man that does the dishes and talks about his feelings. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Right. Right. And, and I think, I think we need to pump, we're pumping that messaging into our boys. We need to pump the messaging that there's courage and vulnerability and there's strength in being able to talk about your emotions and stuff like that. So that's that we need to really flip the way we've been doing things on its head, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the big things that I'm passionate about, you know, there are lots of programs of, um, around Australia teaching children about being safe and stuff, but I, I think mm. we fail at not talking about grooming enough with children. Mm. I've been really fortunate to have, um, I work in remote Aboriginal communities and I've been in 84 of them. Yeah. Um, and the last couple of years, I've actually written 11 songs with Aboriginal kids and we've written oh, one. Wow. I've actually written a song with sextortion in it. Can you believe it? It's just bad. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know. I'll, I'll send you the link. You'll just yeah, love please, them. Please. Yeah. But we wrote one about grooming. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't call it grooming with Aboriginal kids because they would think putting on makeup and brushing your hair. We call sure. it friending them up. Okay. But can you talk about how she groomed you not to tell your father and or your teacher yeah. or something like that? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so pedophiles are experts in their field. They know exactly what they're doing. They know when to do it and they know, they know how to do it. Um, uh, so it sort of started off with, she was my stepmom. She was a new stepmom. She was from another country. 
um, and I just moved into my father's house because um, I hadn't had a relationship with my father for a long time. Um, uh, since the since the initial divorce, it was a very messy divorce between my parents. I hadn't talked to my dad for years, and then all of a sudden, I was longing for this father figure, and he was the only male figure in my life uh, um, or option that I sort of had. So I gravitated towards him. We started going to the gym together and it was actually quite a positive interaction between me and my dad, which I hadn't had before. It went south again after that, but I'm saying at that time it was very positive. Um, and he was remarried with this woman and she was the new stepmom. And I started living with dad because I was so excited about the potential of this, what this relationship between me and him could be. And um, she was just there initially. She wasn't really, you know, it, it was just dad's partner. It wasn't, didn't really think of anything until she asked me to the movies about, about a month or so into me living there, maybe less than a month. She said, oh, let's, let's do something. Let's do a bonding thing. You know, me and you can be the, you know, son and mom, I want to get to know you. So we went to the theater and we're in the movie theater and it was started off with hand holding and the touch on the knees and the legs and the arm around the shoulder and the let's let's um walk home holding hands and stuff like that so that as i said they're experts in the field so it starts off very gradual and it just builds up builds up and they they break more boundaries just little bit by little bit so you don't even notice and obviously i had two parents that were going through a very messy divorce they were focused on that i sort of felt neglected this woman saw an opportunity to come in and fill that void in me and that's exactly what she did and um and i didn't think it was a parental thing i thought it was love i mean when you're 13 and you've got a woman in her mid-20s idolizing you you think oh my god i'm the king of the world like it's because of that that uh conditioning that young boys do get when they're growing up you can't be emotional you can't talk about this you can't talk about that so i thought it was love that was the only explanation in my 13 year old mind i could come to you know and um uh yeah it just it just like i said she initially broke those boundaries and uh, the hugging and hold hand holding sorry turned into cuddling or or hopping into my bed in the morning after my father went to work or something and um before i went to school uh then it turned into kissing and and obviously the more extreme stuff after like the the sexual intercourse so um it in hindsight it happened very quickly but at the time it i just wanted to get more because i thought i was in love with this girl uh with this woman sorry so yeah uh, that's what that's what grooming is. It's calculated. It's coercive, and uh, um, that's how that's that was what, what I experienced. Yeah, very very controlled and and calculated grooming. Also, I mentioned before about young people learning about sex education from pornography. Mm. How at school were you taught sex education because when I'm talking about it you know I talk about the age of consent and stuff like mm. that but you know do you do you feel schools do a good job in teaching sex education because in my experience we do STIs and unwanted pregnancies so you're mm. all getting syphilis and having a baby you don't want but nobody's actually talking about you know consent and the law and what a totally. healthy relationship looks like it's, and it's not extensive it's not extensive at all and i to be honest i can't even remember my sexual education i can't even remember what the class was you know what i mean it's that it's that it's really bare minimum type of stuff especially in an all boys school just make sure you put that on and, and get going type of thing you know what i mean so and i really hope that Chanel Contos's work with um, teachers' consent really takes off because this is the year that it's coming into play. So, I mean, I've got a I've got a brother who's fourteen. Um, so this is just the I really really hope that you know he gets that education and stuff like that because um, yeah, it's so important and um, yeah, uh, it, definitely not enough. But also the the media at the time. I mean, around that time, there was a film that came out with Adam Sandler called "That's My Boy," where the teacher has, where the young 
13 year old boy sleeps with his teacher and has a child and he makes national news and he's this hero and stuff like that. So um, that that's just an example of what the media was out there at the time, but that that's everywhere. I mean, and when you, I'm from a community where I don't play football, but my brother was a footballer and, and it's a very toxic thing in, in and of itself. My father was very football heavy. And if you, if you, didn't play football you're a puff or you know so very horrible very very horrible things and, and ways of thinking um that sort of perpetuated it and 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 exaggerated that 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 way I felt do you know what I mean yeah and you know nowadays like you know I'm so much older than you but nowadays we've got words like uh, coercive control and mm. catfishing and all of these things mm. But they're not written into education. They're not, from my no. perspective, you know, we're no. not talking about um, coercive control and and all of that um, ca uh, gaslighting. There are mm. words for this sort of stuff. You know, she would have gaslighted mm. you. She would have, um, yeah. you know, there was coercive control in, you know, mm. how she and, managed to keep you quiet. Yeah. And the other thing is with those words, they're everywhere. Like everyone's saying them now, but you're right. It's not educated on properly, so they are misused and and they are um they're not the terminology is there like the word is there, but the actual meaning behind it isn't there. So it's just thrown about willy nilly, and it sort of takes away from the seriousness of it in a way. So that's why the education of it's so important, right? So yeah. We actually, I've actually, I'll, I'll send you a link. We actually wrote a song about consent. Oh, and yeah. last year after um, Chanel's initial, you know, it was all yeah. over the media and they released that, the government released that milkshake can, video. Um, oh, right. You, you will have seen it. I uh, don't think I have, to be honest. Oh, really? Oh, no. Well, they, the government at three, cost of, $3 million, they released a video where there was a young girl and a, a fella at a milk bar. And she sure. says to the young man, taste my milkshake. So he does. And he says, oh, no, I prefer mine. So then she puts her hand in the um, cup and wipes cream all over his face. Right. It is so bizarre. And I love right. it, to be honest, because I show it with teenagers and they go, what do the government think? We're stupid, miss. And right. It is so ridiculous that right. I just hope they get it right this time and, and yeah. make, you know, the, the resources that our kids need because they deserve, you know, the best. Um, yeah. at, the, at the time, it was all over the media and, and the um, ABC in Alice Springs uh, rang and said, Holly, have you seen that video? Have you got a comment to make? And I said, have I? And so they played <laughs> three minutes of the milkshake thing and then three minutes of the song that the kids wrote out Bush and have yeah. gone, why did our Central Desert kids get it so right and the government get it so wrong? wrong. Here's Holly from yeah. Safe for Kids to Tell Us Why. Yeah. And I saw interviews with young people. There was a, a young man and they were interviewing him about, you know, because now – Back then in universities, you had to, you know, they talked about consent too late yeah. by the time you're in university to yeah, talk to kids exactly. about consent. Yeah. But this young man, because the you will have seen, I'm sure, the cup of tea and consent video. Yeah, I have seen that, yeah. I quite like it. It's not my favourite, but I quite like it. But this young fella's gone, well, yeah, you know, at uni they showed us that. And, you know, to be honest, I've had I've seen that more times than I've actually had a cup of tea and I was just cracked up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually prefer one that's from Canada that talks about a bike ride and consent because it goes right. so much deeper. Sure. Um, but we need the resources that we need to produce for children needs to be, you know, it, in the milkshake thing, it talked about moving the line, which mm. I think is American gridiron analogy. And we don't understand American yeah. football. Yeah. But, yeah. But not at one stage did it talk about sex or anything like that and yeah. you know, young people aren't stupid and they they yeah. need us to give them tools to be able to to talk about this sort of stuff i think in 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 a general sort of sense i think i think government officials i think the media i think people in in the wider you know in the public we just all need to start getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and it's so imperative i mean just to avoid those issues it, it, 
if we avoid talking about it, then then the victims are going to avoid speaking up about it. So we really, really must get comfortable with the uncomfortable. I love using that because it really, it really, it's like just, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It nails it. It definitely yeah. does. Um, for instance, I sell the book. Everyone's got a bottom, and the oh, amount right. of and the amount of teachers that buy that book from me, and because it says penis and vulva, and yeah. the amount of teachers that either ring or email to say, Holly, I can't read that to my you know grade ones. Well, yeah. if you can't say those words. How can we expect um, you know a six year old yeah. to say that? Yeah. And um, I had the pleasure of interviewing. Emma Haskinson, Hackinson, sorry, Hackinson. And um, she was saying that because her story is similar to yours where it was a female perpetrator mm. and she said, you know, her family knew something was wrong and they were saying, was it this man? Was it this man? And at no stage did anybody say, um, you know, and she, she thought she disclosed to her mum because she said, that lady's weird, thinking mm. that her family would, you know, she was totally transparent yeah. and why didn't her family understand that? Mm -hmm. So unless we give kids, in my, you know, in my opinion, solid, clear messages around this stuff, we can't just assume that they'll understand. Yeah. And so, you know, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, I just love that. Yeah. It's about, it's also about prevention over reaction, right? You've got to stop it at the root. You can't wait around for it to happen. And then figure it out. We've got to put these preventative measures in place so we can protect our children. That's uh, that's all it's about at the end of the day. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people actually say, you know, don't like programs like mine because they say it's putting the responsibility on children to mm. keep themselves safe. Definitely and not. It's, it's safe far from them. it. Yeah, it's, it's far, far from, from it. it. Um, because um, I'm sure you've heard, seen the work that Poppy and Rose have done. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I was at a conference and, and they presented and, you know, Rose said at five, I didn't have the words. Yeah. And so, you know, we need to listen to like young people like them and yeah. like you. Mm. And that's why I reached out because I want to make the best resources that will, you know, it's not, kids are the last line of defense. It is yeah. our, our jobs as yeah. adults to keep you safe. Yeah. But we can't always be there. And yeah. so, you know, that's why it needs to be taught in schools. It needs to be taught at home. It needs to be everybody working together to keep kids mm. safe. Totally. And so, and... you know, if if I, you know, one of the things that I do with young people is I ring the kids' helpline with the kids. Yeah, right. Because as, like with you, um, I mean, at that age, did you know about the kids' helpline and that you could have? No idea. Was not promoted. I just wanted to say as well that Rose saying that she didn't have the language at five. I didn't even have the language at thirteen, or the or the mental capacity to even understand what was happening to me. So yeah, it just goes to show across the whole spectrum. Like it's not to take away from yeah, but you know what I mean. Like even no, definitely. At, yeah, yeah. Like it's it's so imperative that it's educated to for, for and and also re touched on regularly um throughout the years of, of kids growing up and stuff yes. so they're not they don't forget about it yeah yeah but um so one of the things that we do with the children is we help them set up a safety team of five adults they can talk to and we use the hand so on the thumb would be people from their home and then two people from school and then two people from the community but that's why i also introduce at that stage the kids helpline because you know, you've already said that your mum and dad were going through some stuff, so they wouldn't have been on your safety team. Yeah. She yeah. definitely wouldn't be on your safety team. Yeah. And so, you know, you weren't, um, were you playing any sport? You said you didn't like football, but were you playing? No, any? was so not part were... of any sporting thing. I was in um drama at school. Yeah, I went to NIDA and stuff. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you might not have had a big safety team, but the fact yeah. that, you know, you said that the kids helpline, to, to be honest, um, that's why I physically ring the kids helpline because, you know, kids will see the ad on the TV and it just washes over them. Yeah. But when I physically, with every class, ring the kids helpline, out of everything that I teach kids, I go, oh, oh, you know, that wasn't a simulator missile. That was, you know, that's a real person sort of thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it takes away the stigma and the fact that, you know, it's 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. But if you had have rung the kids helpline and found somebody you connected with, mm. you can keep ringing that same person. You don't have yeah. to keep telling your story over and over. Yeah. And now, as well as male or female, they also have Aboriginal counsellors, which is a new thing. Wow. And wow. they also have um, people that identify as non-binary. Wow. This is That's mind phenomenal. blowing, yeah, <laughs> isn't yeah. it? Isn't it? And yeah. I feel like I just need to be shouting this because yeah, yeah. if you had a rung and just, you know, I'm in this relationship, but, I, you know, there's no judgment. But the fact that, and if you need ongoing counselling, you can arrange it, say, at 10 o'clock on a Saturday, I'm going to ring whatever. There will yeah. never, ever be two people with the same name. So it can't get mixed up. Yeah. You know, we need to give young people that opportunity because, you know, teenagers don't want to talk to old people like me. They probably would talk to people like you. I mean, I bet once you go into schools, you will have, like Daniel, you know, you'll know Daniel uh, Priestley. Yes. Yeah. I've he not, has I've, a line I've, of boys up the, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, wow. Well. You will have the same because they'll just want to come to you and just talk after. Yeah. The best conversations you'll have will be after your big talk. So I, I yeah, can just yeah. see it right now. <laughs> but if they know that they can ring the kids' helpline and there's no judgment, and you know, I just think that is just that tool alone. Yeah, is worthwhile. It's so imperative, so imperative that it's implemented. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. Oh, thank um, you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. If you could give parents. Um, I mean, I won't tell you, I usually say uh, be your parent, child's Google and, you know, we want yeah. you, your children to come to you. But if you could leave parents with one last thought or a teacher, one last thought about what would have helped you back in the day, what would it be? I'd say with the benefit of hindsight, I would tell the adult, I would have told the adults in my life at the time, go with your intuition. If you feel like something's happening, it probably is. And if it's not, it's better that you checked than just let it go. I've had so many adults in my life come forward now and say, oh, we had a feeling, but we never knew who. And I just wish they asked the question. Oh, um, yeah. Because it could have changed, it could have changed the tra uh, trajectory of my story, uh, very like, yeah, immensely. So yeah, if if that intuition's there, go and ask for the go and ask the question. Um, there's no harm in asking. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. In our program, we actually call them early warning signs. It's our yeah. flight, flight freeze, that gut feeling. And thanks to a, a dear young 10-year-old in a remote community, I actually have a T-shirt with listen to kids, believe kids, and trust your guts. Oh, I love it. And, um, you know, that's what we have to do. We have, And whenever I wear it, it doesn't matter, you know, I'm walking through Alice Springs Airport and I have three people stopping me going, oh, I yeah. love that. We need to have that everywhere sort of thing. <laughs> And, um, you know, we need to have billboards with, you know, these messages on and, yeah. um, you know, with your clothing range. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you giving really it to us. Thank you.